study in the book of Joshua today. You know, I've said before, the church is the hope of the world. And I want to modify that a little bit. I want to say that the church is the only hope of the world. And for one reason, because the church has been entrusted with the stewardship of the gospel of God's grace. The gospel that saves souls like no other gospel can, like nothing else can. There's one gospel and there's one way to heaven, and it's through the work of Christ on the cross, Jesus. And as I was sitting here just worshiping this morning, I was thinking, you know, I don't think there's anything more important to God than the salvation of people's souls. Nothing pulls down from the top priority of God's priority list His children being saved, spending eternity with Him. I mean, ask yourselves, if, if your child, forget the kidnapped, that your child is just simply lost and you don't know where they are, what becomes number one priority in your life? What becomes the single most important thing? It's not whether you're going to get that career, or whether the, the check cleared, or whether the vacation is all taken care of. The only thing that really counts is the restoration of the relationship between you and your child. And I think God feels the same way. And because of that, all through the Old and New Testament, God points to the gospel of grace, the gospel that saves. He gives a hint over here. He gives an example here. There's a type and shadow of what the gospel is going to do and, and how it's going to work, how God is going to use the work of Christ on the cross to save people like you and I. And Joshua is just full of those illustrations of the salvation by grace through faith. We're going to look at some of those today. You know, the entire Bible is full of promises. Promises of deliverance in times of trouble, protection in times of danger, peace in times of turmoil, strength in times of weakness, mercy at those times that we fail, provision in times of need, wisdom in times of decision-making. The Bible is full of those promises, not just the promise of heaven someday, but the promise of a relationship with God here and now, every day. And those promises are made by the one who keeps his promises to a thousand generations. And, and because of that, we can be confident that those promises are sure and true, and we can believe those promises and, and, and we do, we believe those promises, and we profess those promises, but we saw last week that seldom, or at least oftentimes, we fail to possess the promises found in Scripture. I thought about that this past week. I thought, why is it we find it so difficult to embrace and possess the promises of God? All those promises in the Bible, and I think Jesus taught us one of the reasons. It's in Matthew 12, when Jesus says again, how can anyone... Enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions or promises unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. You and I have been robbed of promises made by the one who is faithful. We haven't possessed those promises because we have been bound. We are the, the owners of our homes, so to speak, the captains of our ship, if you will, of our own lives, and we have been robbed. So many of us have been bound by unbelief, which is too good to be true. And that's true, it's too good to be true, but it's too great to be missed. We've been bound by fear. We've been bound by discouragement. We've been bound by apathy. We've been bound by distraction. We've been bound by getting off on the, on the wrong course, pursuing the wrong things. And because of that bondage, we have failed to possess God's promises. And so we don't read or we don't experience what we read about in the Bible, and, and after a while, you kind of get used to it. After a while, it starts to feel familiar, so we settle down, we settle in, and we settle for what we've got. And you know what we've got? We've got unclaimed inheritance. Blessings from God that are never received, promises from God that have been stolen from us over and over again, and we end up with a life that is far different than the life promised to those who put Christ at the head of their lives. But Jesus also taught that we don't have to miss out on those promises. In Luke 11, he went on to say, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. 
So promises are stolen when a strong man comes in and binds the, 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 the owner of the home, but promises are embraced and they're safe when we are fully armed. You know, I read a verse just this morning. It wasn't really in my message, but it says, since Christ suffered for us in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude. How is a strong man fully armed? We're armed with our attitudes. Are they attitudes of faith or fear and unbelief and doubt? That's kind of what this series in Joshua is all about. It's teaching us how to be armed, how to prepare ourselves to win the spiritual battles in life. And these battles aren't the battles with demons on hills and storms and all the The battles, spiritual battles in most people's lives are waged on the battlefield of their mind in their attitudes, in their thoughts, in their faith, or in their fear. We want to learn how to guard what God has given us. We want to understand how to do more than just profess God's promises. We want to learn how to possess all of God's promises. A prophet in in the Old Testament named Obadiah said it best. He said, possessing our inheritance. An inheritance is something you don't earn. You didn't earn it. It wasn't yours until somebody who had earned it decided to freely give it to you. Those are the promises of the Bible. That's why the Bible calls God's promises inheritance. And it says you can possess the inheritance, unmerited by you, but given by one who had earned it. The book of Exodus told us about God's mercy in leading Israel out of Egypt. And here the book of Joshua tells us of God's mercy leading Israel into the promised land. You know, it's not enough to just leave your old life. A lot of people think, I want to become a Christian, so I've got to clean up my act. And i got to stop doing this and stop doing this and stop doing this. And, you know, I can't do this. And, and, and there's a portion of that, but that's only half the battle. We, we, it's not just enough to leave your old life. You need to enter a new life, too. There need to be additions to what you do, not just subtractions. The Bible says there's a taking off and there's a putting on. Ephesians says you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And there again, it's back to that battlefield of our minds, our attitudes. So why is the book of Joshua timely for us today? I mean, this is a bunch of desert dwellers that crossed a river and entered into a new land. And how does that apply to us today? Because too many people, too many of us, have lives that look just like Israel's journey. That's why we called this title or titled this this series The Journey because our journey looks scarily similar to Israel's journey. Many people are just wandering through spiritual deserts, having a momentary drink of water here or a little bit of shade here, a little bit of relief, but most of the time just living in the harsh cruelties and difficulties found in deserts. And their future looks no better tomorrow than it is today. And so people find themselves living lives that are just going in circles. They've heard about the promised land, but they've never seen it. They've never experienced it. But the beauty is, and the hope is, and the good news is, it doesn't have to stay that way. It didn't for Israel. They wandered a desert in unbelief for 40 years, but the promise was still embraced and experienced. Israel was about to embark on the adventure of a lifetime. And they were going to face some battles with some pretty tough enemies. They would overcome some difficult and even some impossible circumstances, and they'd see God rescue them over and over and over again. Israel would travel to places they'd only heard about, and they'd experience blessings they'd only dreamed about for years. And I honestly believe that if we can learn the lessons in this book, in this story, in this portion of the Bible, then we can learn these lessons and experience what they experienced. Israel is about to end 40 years of circling, 40 years of hearing about God's promise, 40 years of waiting for God's promise, 40 years of dreaming about God's promise. This day, they begin the process to possess those promises. And it is a process. And the only thing that stood in their way from that first initial acceptance, possession of their inheritance, understanding and experiencing the promises of God, the the first thing and only thing that at this point stood in their way was the Jordan River. 
Crossing the Jordan was very similar to crossing the Red Sea. Both required a miraculous intervention by God, and both would require a step of faith by Israel. That when the miraculous intervention of God is met by the step of faith of people, guess what? Things happen. So it's very similar to what they'd already been through crossing the Red Sea, but there was one difference. When they left Egypt, they were fleeing their enemy. Leaving the desert and crossing the Jordan, now they're going to pursue their enemy. And there's a difference there. People who only profess the promises of God spend their entire life running from their enemy, their own weakness, their own unbelief, their own lack of faith, their own fear. People who don't really possess the promises, but they profess them to other people, they spend their life fleeing from the things that bind them. People who possess God's promises spend their lives pursuing their enemies, wa waging war against the, the, the carnal nature, so to speak, according to the Bible, or the flesh, or the world, or anything else. There's a difference between fleeing from your enemy and pursuing your enemy. And that was one of the differences that took place when Israel star stopped wandering the desert and started possessing the promises. Canaan is often spoken of as an example of, of entering heaven. And I want to tell you, that's a bad example. The promised land is not an example or a, a dangling carrot of heaven in the life of believers. Canaan, uh, you know, in, in order to enter Canaan, it would require battles and conflict and struggle and difficulty. Heaven has none of that. Too many people equate heaven to Canaan and think, I've got to fight my way into heaven. We can't fight our way into heaven. That's why it's called grace. We're saved by grace through faith. This not of yourself, it's the free gift of God. Jesus won the battles that allow us to enter heaven. And too many people have this works mentality that says, if I'm just good enough, I can get to heaven. I can get to the promised land. It's not a works-driven promise. It's a grace-driven promise. Canaan represents the promises we find in the Bible. Promises of blessing, provision, protection, direction, abundant life. That's what the promised land offered, a land flowing with milk and honey. And in many ways, that's what the Bible promises. But let me be very, very clear that doesn't mean a pain-free existence. It doesn't mean all your problems go away. It doesn't mean there aren't difficulties and challenges and disappointments and failures and hardships and injustice and pain and suffering. It's through many trials you enter the kingdom of heaven, Paul said. But it is a land flowing with milk and honey. And too many people want to settle for bread and water instead of milk and honey, just merely existing in this life and not really living this life. And the Bible makes it very clear. The Apostle John, one of Jesus' closest allies, intimate friends, knew Jesus from the beginning, saw him resurrected, and he said simply, he who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son of God has not life. And that what he's saying is, life with all the turmoil and all the difficulties with Jesus is still life. And life with all the blessings and all this world can offer without Jesus is nothing. This whole story is a preview of things to come for people who trust Jesus. Freedom from slavery, like Israel, we're freed from the slavery of sin and the bondage of sin. The Passover, faith in the blood that would make the atonement. Canaan, all the promises of God. Salvation from Egypt for Israel was all grace. God did all the work. Salvation is a gift. It's not a reward. God performed all the miracles. And entering the promised land would require faith. Stepping out in faith. Obeying in faith. Fighting battles by faith. The spiritual truths illustrated in this story where Israel left the desert, crossed the Jordan, entered the promised land, is this, salvation, like from Egypt, comes only by the grace of God. Possessing God's promises come only by faith in God. And there's a difference. Grace had nothing to do with us, but possessing the promises of God has a lot to do with us. And then one last thing before we look at chapter 3. The Ark of the Covenant 
is one of the major focuses in this book. The Ark of the Covenant is mentioned nine times in this chapter and seven times in the next one. And the Ark is full of symbolism about the gospel of God's grace that saved the souls of people. It's full of the, the illustrations of God's plan of salvation. So let's jump into Joshua chapter 3. I'm going to read 17 verses and then we'll kind of pull it apart a little bit. It says in verse 1, Early in the morning Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are the Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so, that, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's water, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to the, cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the waters from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had complete, completed the crossing on, on dry ground. Kind of a freaky story. The Jordan River flooded every year at this time. And so They've been given this great promise, all of Israel, that God was going to deliver them into the promised land with a mighty hand through great miracles, and they would defeat all the enemies. And so they get right to the edge of the promise, the promised land, and for three days the children of Israel watched the river rise. Each day things got worse and worse and looked more and more impossible. The waters would rage and churn. Torrents of water would race past them as the Jordan was flooding. And literally, this Jordan River became a river of impossibility. It became impossible. Nobody could cross this river at flood stage. Least of all, two million men, women, and children with all their possessions and their wagons and their livestock without any boats and with no bridges. A river of impossibility, just so close and yet so far from the promise of God they had come as far as is humanly possible. And at this moment, they are totally dependent upon God. If they're going to go one inch further, they're going to have to depend upon God. And you know, that describes a lot of us. We think we've come a long way on our own. It's been by the grace of God. I hate it when I hear people, you, ever, you like Shark Tank? I watch Shark Tank all the time. Love that show. Love that show. But I hate it when they talk about Mark Cuban being a self-made billionaire. Nobody's a self-made anything except a self-made sinner. They totally excise out God out of the equa equation. And that's what people do all too often. They think that they're standing on their own two feet. Listen, who can stand without the help of God? 
if we're going to go any further than we are right now today, it's not going to be by determination. It's not going to be by pulling ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps. It's not going to be by the, the, the discipline that we exercise or anything else. It's going to be by the grace of God. So put your dependence there to get beyond where you are today. Psalm 107, David describes Israel's exodus out of Egypt. He says they were hungry and thirsty and their lives ebbed away. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them in their distress. He says they stumbled and there was no one to help them and then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. Verse 18, they loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them from all their distress. Verse 27, they were at their wit's end, and then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brought them out of their distress. You see a pattern there? Do You see kind of a habit? Where people wait until life crashes down around them to cry out to the Lord, and even then, God, with His grace and mercy, delivers them out of their distress. But don't wait for times of distress or desperation to cry out to God. Begin each and every day with that dependence, that awareness, that if we're going to go any further than we are right now, it's going to be by God's grace. Here is where the Ark of the Covenant is first mentioned in chapter 3. The Ark was designed by God, instructed by God to be built four feet long, two and a half feet high, and two and a half feet wide, and it was going to be made of pure gold. And on top of the ark, is, is you, there's supposed to be a picture of an ark there. Uh, that's not the ark. It, it looks a lot different than that. On top of the ark, two angels would have their wings swept forward, forming a seat that God said, that will be the mercy seat. Inside the ark, God commanded certain things to be put in the ark. I can tell some of you were looking. I, I knew it was up there because you just totally spaced and ignored me completely. <laughs> That's the mercy seat on top where the, where the wings are swept forward. And inside the ark, God instructed that the two broken tablets of the law that Moses threw down when he came off Mount Sinai would be put in the ark. And along with the broken law, he wanted some of the manna that God rained down from heaven to feed Israel in the desert for 40 years. And then the final thing he instructed to be put in the ark was Aaron's staff. Remember the staff that had budded and bore fruit? That ark represents God's presence with Israel. God's everywhere. He's not contained in a four-foot by two-and-a-half by two-and-a-half foot box. It's simply a representation of God's physical presence with Israel. And they were told by Joshua... Be prepared to follow that ark whenever it moves and wherever it goes. And we're going to see here in a second that that ark is nothing more than an exact uh, illustration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be, be prepared to follow Him whenever He moves and wherever He goes. That's the illustration of this portion of Joshua. God instructs Joshua to keep the ark a half a mile ahead of everybody, a thousand yards of, ahead of everybody. You know why? Because with that many people, if it was any closer, not everybody could see the ark. They all needed to see where the ark was going. God's present, what, presence wasn't just for the select few, the Levites or the priests or the really holy people or the people with the deep pockets or the people that had served the most. No, it's a, it's a universal gospel, and everybody needs to hear it, and everybody needs to see it. The ark was for everyone, just as Jesus, who the ark represents, is for everyone today. Whosoever will, let him come. And what's the thing you notice when you look at that ark? People would see that ark a thousand yards ahead, half a mile ahead, in this gold glistening in the sun of the, of the desert, and they'd see the mercy seat. The mercy seat is where God's presence dwelled. He wasn't in the ark. He was upon the mercy seat. You know what the priest would do on that mercy seat? That's where the priest would sprinkle blood for the atonement of the sins of Israel. And as people watched the ark, they knew what was inside. They remembered what was inside, the broken tablets of stone, the law. The ark covered a law that had been broken. Do you see the symbolism there? God in His wisdom and His mercy 
wanting to begin showing what he would do through Christ so, so many years ahead. On top of the ark, God's presence. On the mercy seat. Inside the ark was the broken law, and in between God and the broken law was the blood that was shed for the atonement of sins. So God, seated on the mercy seat, had no contact with the broken law because it was blood between God and that broken law. It illustrates God's plan of salvation. Jesus standing between God and our sins. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ and his work on Calvary. And then there were inside the ark that golden bowl of manna, food sent from heaven to a desert, feeding two million people, proof of God's faithfulness to provide for his people, proof that he does keep his promises to a thousand generations. And then there was Aaron's staff. In the book of Numbers, people began to rebel against Aaron and Moses. They began to grumble. They didn't like the leaders God gave them. And as a sign that God had chosen Moses as leader and Aaron as priest, God instructs Moses. He says, Moses, I want you to get one staff from every one of the 12 tribes, and I want you to to take it into that tent of meetings. Then I'm going to go to that tent, and I'm going to do something. And in number 17, it says, The next day Moses entered the tent of the testimony and saw that Aaron's staff, which represented the house of Levi, had not only sprouted, but had budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. These were... Twelve staffs, these were twelve dead sticks brought back to life again was Aaron's. A visible example of what God offers. Resurrection, new life, and fruitfulness. So when the people looked at the ark and they'd remember inside that ark, God's law, the broken stone tablets. They would remember God's mercy because they would see the mercy seat. They would remember God's provision because they knew the manna was there. They would remember God's miracles because Aaron's staff was in there, something dead brought back to life again. And remember, that ark pointed ahead to Jesus. Outside the ark on the mercy seat, his shed blood between God and sin. Inside the ark, the broken tablets of the law, you know, the law that teaches the way to live, the way we should live. The manna, Proof that God's promises are true. Aaron's staff, illustrating new life. All illustrating Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So the ark was a physical dwelling place of God's presence. And they were told to fix their eyes upon the ark. Not the river. Not the flooding, churning, raging water. Not the obstacle to the promise. Fix your eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, the Bible says. It's so easy to see the problems, to see the obstacle, and to forget about the promise or the promise giver. They were told, follow that ark. Look, looking at it isn't enough. Seeing the ark isn't enough. You know, a lot of people look but don't follow Jesus. A lot of people applaud him as a great teacher, a good man, maybe even a prophet. They're just spiritual spectators. They're content to live in a desert. They go, well, it's a dry heat. It's, it's not too bad living in the desert. I, it's not ideal. It's not what I would choose, but it's, I can survive it. When obstacles stand between you and God's promises, remember God's mercy, the mercy seat. Remember God's promises, like with the manna. Remember God's miracles, like with the staff. And then God says, consecrate yourselves today through Joshua consecrate or sanctify yourselves he says get your eyes right look at the ark get your heart right and then your life will be right people ask me all the time and have for years how do I get right with God first Thessalonians says may God himself the God of peace sanctify you through and through May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctifying means simply becoming like Jesus, being declared not guilty, being declared righteous. John 17 says, Jesus says, For, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. First Peter says, Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And do you see what happened just then? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three work together to help us get our lives right with God. 
It requires the Godhead to make us like Jesus, to make us acceptable. Without, without the Holy Spirit, we can't know the truth. We can't be convicted of sin. Without Christ's work on the cross, we have no hope of forgiveness. And without the grace and mercy and faithfulness of God the Father, no, the gospel never would have happened to begin with. And then the priests are told to step out and stand still in the middle of the river, which, by the way, both require faith. It requires faith to, to walk, to step out, and it requires faith to stand sometimes. God said, get your eyes right, fix it on the ark. Get your hearts right, sanctify yourselves. And then he says, get your feet right. Step out into the Jordan. Because even with your eyes right and your heart right, you still need to get your feet wet. And then in verse 10 it says, Joshua says, this is how you will know that the living God is among you, that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. He said, this is how you're going to know. How do you know God's among you? How do you know God is active and involved in your life? Well, I'll tell you how you don't know. You don't know by feelings. You can have all the Holy Ghost goosebumps you want, and that doesn't mean you're right with God at all. It's not by signs and wonders and miracles. People want to say, well, look, God's healing people, and people are speaking in tongues and prophesying and doing all those things, and sometimes that's God. A lot of times it's not. The Bible says Satan does counterfeit miracles too. You can't trust your feelings. You can't trust signs and wonders and miracles. You can't trust blessings and prosperity because some of the most wicked, evil men that, that I perceive are some of the most successful and prosperous men. And I'm talking about men in the ministry. It's, it's not by feelings or signs or wonders or miracles or blessings or prosperity. It's by the power to overcome our weak nature, and to become like God, to become like Jesus. Jesus said in Acts 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. All seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, all seven of them were told by Jesus the same thing, overcome. Don't surrender, overcome. Don't live in a desert. Overcome and find the promise. Don't stay the way you are. Overcome yourself and become like Jesus, like who I want you to be. He would say, overcome your past. Overcome your fears and your doubts. Overcome your insecurity. Overcome your apathy. Overcome your circumstances. Because John, the apostle, said, everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. I love the fact that jo Joshua can't contain himself. When he's talking about God, he doesn't just say God, the Lord. He goes, God, the Lord, over all the earth. There's no place he's not Lord of. He, he's saying, remember who we belong to. He's saying, guys, what's a flooded, churning river to the God over all the earth? What are these uncircumcised Canaanites for God who's Lord over all the earth? What's your problem today for God who's Lord over all the earth? He says, step out and the river will dry up. Now that's different than what happened at the Red Sea, remember? At the Red Sea, I mean, you saw the movie, Charlton Heston, you, you saw him, held up the, he was there, held up the staff and the river parted and they all crossed over on dry land. Moses held out his staff and dried up the water first which tells me sometimes God removes obstacles so we can step out, and other times he says, step out, and then I'll remove the obstacle, just like he did here. He says, no, you're going to have to get your feet wet. You get in that river, that flooding torrent of water, that churning water that's flooding at, at, at breaks neck speed, and all dried up. And that's exactly what he did. I would have hated to be the first priest. Yeah, you like, I'd like to be the priest, front and left, carrying the ark. You've got to be the first one to step in that water. I'd rather have been the priest in back. Then if I saw the priest's head float by, I'd say, I'm not, God didn't say that. I'm exercising discernment. But you know what? That front left priest, he was the one that saw the miracle firsthand. He was the one that sensed the presence of God right there on the mercy seat. 
He was the one that saw God stop a river to fulfill his promise. And he did it by stepping into a flooding, raging torrent of water by faith. And you know he was standing right there on the edge. Should I or shouldn't I? Do I trust Joshua or not? Did God really say that? And there came that moment when he said, screw it, I'm going to go for it. Well, in the Greek, it, that's what it means, in the, in the Hebrew. And he's the one who got to see the miracle, all because he was willing to be right on the edge, stepping out in faith. And all of Israel passed into the promised land on dry ground. After 40 years of wandering, they entered the promised land, possessing that promise. And possessing God's promise began with one step. It wasn't a 40-mile journey. It was a one-step journey from that day. Do I step and get my feet wet? Do I go for it? Do I take whatever step God wants me to take? You know, the same is true for us. Today can be a new beginning of going where you've never been, being who you've never been before, experiencing what you've only heard about, thought about, maybe dreamed about. And it begins with one step, a step of faith, a decision that says, I'm going to stand on the edge and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to let God do whatever he wants. Lord, here am I. Do with me whatever you will. That's when things change. That's when promises start getting possessed. And I honestly believe that God wants to take us where we've never been before. And like Israel, he didn't put this in the story for them to read. They're already in heaven. He put this story in the Bible so we would read it and say, God did amazing things with them. Maybe he'll do amazing things among us. And he will. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be battles to fight. There's going to be enemies to defeat. There's going to be times that require faith. But if we will take that first step, step out in faith, decide to go for it, then we can go where we've never been before. We will see God do great things for us and we'll begin to possess the promises, not just profess them. You know what happens when that happens? You never go back to being content in the desert again. You never be satisfied just wandering in circles, and you never be content to live like you did before. And isn't that what we're all after? Let's pray. Father, uh, we're so tempted to read this story as if it was a novel, watch it as if it was a movie, to sit and try to uh, be entertained by it and, and never be inspired by it, never be challenged by it. God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would challenge and inspire and motivate all of us to say, we don't want to just live life in circles. We don't want to just wander around for 40 years in unbelief. We don't want to just profess all the promises we say we believe in the Bible. We want to start experiencing those. We want to start living those. We want to possess those promises. And God, we confess to you that we are absolutely dependent upon you 100% to be able to do that. We can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can't decide enough. We can't be disciplined enough. So God, we pray that you would give us the faith to take that one step to decide that today and this week I will be who God wants me to be. I'll be who I've never made, maybe even never been able to be before, but by God's grace, I will be this week. And may we find your presence and recognize your mercy, just like we see on the ark, your presence seated on the mercy seat. I pray, God, that you would be with us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.